welcoming someone new to the podium tonight and uh, also welcoming a veteran back because Jeff Moore was here earlier in the year speaking on the evolution in Islamic insurgency in Asia, which if you haven't heard, I encourage you to go to the Westminster YouTube channel and, and see Jeff's superb presentation on that subject. What we're talking about tonight is, of course, somewhat related, but it will be a tag team affair because May Lee Dozier is also going to speak. We're delighted to have her here as she is an Asia-focused analyst who has worked in a broad array of uh, areas, including journalism, uh, national security issues, uh, the shifting geopolitical landscape, et cetera. And relevant to our topic tonight is that uh, May Lee went to Sri Lanka and visited the sites of the Easter attacks, the hotels mm -hmm. and the churches, so that she learned even more through the experience of witnessing that. Uh, she received an MA in International Relations and International Economics from Johns Hopkins Zeiss and her BA at the University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Excuse me, Jeff Moore is the CEO of Muir Analytics. I told you at the topic he addressed here last time, he earned his PhD in Thai counterinsurgency strategies and tactics from the University of Exeter in the UK, obviously. Uh, now, Jeff has worked widely in the defense area as a contractor, security consultant, uh, supported U.S. Army, Army's Plans and Operations Division, G3, in the Pentagon, uh, and the Department of Defense's Force Transformation, among other things. He taught uh, counterterrorism and COIN at uh, National Defense University. Jeff has published widely in a number of journals, magazines, Jane's Terrorism and Insurgency Center, U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings, etc. Most notably, he's the author of two books, inclu including Spies for Nimitz. Yes. Have you sold the film's no. rights to that? No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Spies for Nimitz, Joint Military Intelligence in the Pacific War, and... The other book, The Thai Way of Counterinsurgency. Tonight, uh, Jeff and May Lee will be addressing ISIS leadership jihad and the Sri Lanka attacks. Welcome. So tonight we're going to get a little tactical on you. We're actually going to unpack uh, the, a little bit about the strategy, but a lot about the tactics <clears throat> behind the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. And we're going to do it the same way we did our presentation back in September about ISIS in Southeast Asia. We're going to do it by data points, and we're going to flow through them very quickly, and we're going to get to the end and talk about some analyses and assessments. What does this mean for the future? So our agenda, did I do that right? Our agenda, we're going to check the map, talk about a summary of the attacks. We'll linger on that for just a minute because it wasn't just about a couple of church and hotel bombings, it was a much uh, a broader and more in-depth operation. We'll talk about who did it, a little bit about the bombs, and then the actual attacks on the churches and the hotels, and then there were three more devices that went off, and then the aftermath, where another device went off, and lots of arms caches were found. And then, of course, <laughs> conclusions. Um, like Robert said, this is a, 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 a briefing based on open sources, but May Lee was on the ground there. She stayed at two of the hotels that were hit, uh, she interviewed quite a few people on the ground and, and actually got a government person to drive her around a little bit and picked up some inf extra information that way. This was a 9-11 style event for a country that had gone through 30 years of warfare with the Tamil Tigers. So it was a, a, a great shock to them. Um, and one quick note, the, the situation is what we call out of the critical stage. The actual terrorist cell that carried out this attack is no more but the broader organizations still exist. And the aftermath of what they did is having a ripple effect on the uh, um, Muslim versus Buddhist uh, type uh, strife that is ongoing in, uh, in Sri Lanka. And they actually had a, a big riot on Monday where at least one person was killed. 
And so these data points are still evolving and the investigation into exactly what happened is also still evolving. So what we have is the best we could do up to this point, but we've got a lot of good data and some good conclusions. Check the map, everybody knows where Sri Lanka is. The red dots or the red squares, mind you, are where actual uh, kinetic action happened, where some explosions happened. And the uh, orange squares are where some what we call combat support or combat service support activities happen, bomb making and those kinds of things. But there's scores of other places on the map where that touched, uh, uh, that this particular organization touched. Um, and then there's, uh, again, a lot of strife in the northern part of the country right now between Muslims and Buddhists. So a summary of the attack. Again, it wasn't just three churches and four hotels. It was a three-phased operation, right? It was a spectacular attack, the kind that Al-Qaeda and ISIS really like to carry out. It was highly synchronized and organized. It was a multi-stage operation, as we can see here. And it was what we call, uh, or what the US military calls, a high payoff uh, target or high payoff event. Um, and again, it happened mostly in the greater Colombo metro area and in one town on the east uh, in, in Batikaloa. So what were the three phases? Phase one was Easter, D-Day for this particular uh, terror attack. 21 April, 2019, eight suicide bombers hit three churches, right? And then uh, one, two, three, four, five suicide bombers hit four hotels. And they just didn't hit the hotels, they didn't hit the lobbies, they hit the restaurants. Why? Because the restaurants were packed full of people. Uh, people attending uh, a big uh, the, the Easter uh, breakfast buffets, very popular throughout uh, Sri Lanka, especially in the five-star hotels. The last hotel hit was uh, like a budget hotel, the new tropical inn. Phase two happened within, or it began within about 90 minutes after the first bombs. We have a vehicle-borne IED or a car bomb or technically a van bomb that went off or tried to, uh, they tried to explode it, mind you, outside St. Anthony's Shrine, but it did not blow up. Uh, we'll get to that later. There was a roadside IED planted near the airport. That did not detonate either. But this lure or come on bombing did occur when law enforcement went to the house or the condo of one of the bomber's wives. She was waiting for them with a suicide device. She detonated, killing herself unborn child, three children, and three police. And this was planned. It wasn't something that happened by chance. Phase three. Uh, phase three was the technically the last stand of this particular section of this terrorist cell. They knew that law enforcement was going to come serve a warrant on them or an arrest warrant or a search warrant at some point. When they were laying in wait for them, engaged in about uh, a one hour firefight and then detonated their suicide devices, killing 16 people, including themselves. So overall, there were about 12 operatives involved, at least 14 to 16 bombs, 14 to 16 IEDs. They targeted 11 establishments and successfully, or they had uh, targeted 11, in, uh, excuse me, 11 entities, and they successfully hit nine of them. Casualties were pretty astronomical, 258 killed and 500 wounded. That's um, over 700 casualties and if you uh, do the math, uh, a Marine uh, battalion is about 1,000 people. Three, uh, three battalions, I think, still make up a regiment, or regiment's about 3,000 people. So that is a very high casualty rate for a terrorist attack. Um, and the culprits were, we'll get into that in a minute, NTJ, JMI, which were is an, uh, excuse me, an ISIS franchise. And having gone over the summary, we're gonna turn it over to Mei Li, who's gonna talk about the indicators and warnings that were coming along through history that a lot of folks absolutely missed, but should have picked up to uh, figure out that these bombings were actually going to happen. Mei Li? Okay, on that note, um, I have to say that this really is an extremely truncated um, list. Yeah, speak up a little louder. Sure. Um, we're really only going to cover the period from 2013 until the day of the Easter bombing attacks. First, we'll talk about uh, multiple Muslim versus Buddhist strife. Um, there are at least five major instances of this between the period of 2013 and the, in the last six years. Um, there is multiple instances of Islamist jihadist versus Sufi Muslim um, clashes. And again, there are at least five instances of this. 
Some of these um, occur before 2013 because the, the vast uh, majority of that tension occurred in the mid-2000s. Also, there are many, there are at least five major instances of moderate and Sufi Muslims informing on Islamist jihadists directly to the Sri Lankan government. Um, actually, there's actually many more, and uh, I, I can't say this is enough. I came across this a lot. Um, a lot of them didn't report it. They, they told government under the radar, um, so this is really an under account. Uh, there is also at least ma eight major um, instances of Sri Lankans and foreign governments giving threat warnings and indicators to the Sri Lankan government. This is, has been considered um, a major intelligence failure on the part of the Sri Lankan government, and that's really kind of one of the big stories of this attack. Um, okay, let's talk about Buddhist versus Muslim strife. Um, this really, again, this is an inc incredibly truncated list, and there's a major event um, in Alutgama in 2014 that reflects um, what is a rising Buddhist nationalism in Sri Lanka, um, not, not so different from the one that we're seeing in Myanmar. Um, but on the 3rd of March in Digana Kandi, um, a Buddhist man was beaten by Muslim youth, and this led to five days of religious communal violence. Um, miraculously, only two people were killed. However, 20 mosques, 224 houses, 119 businesses were damaged and destroyed. Um, there's video footage of this. There's CCTV footage of police um, actually not stepping up and disappearing. And this really um, made Muslims feel like the police were not going to protect them. Um, I think a lot of people see this as the point where a lot of Muslims uh, really started to turn and the point where, you know, like this is kind of something of a tipping point for the Islamist jihadists as well. On the 26th of December, um, young men on motorcycles went around a town and they defaced Buddha statues. Um, they would take them and, and, and whack off their, their faces. It was uh, incredibly insulting to the Buddhists. This is a Buddhist majority country. Uh, Muslims make up only about 10%, 70% uh, or more are Buddhist. Okay, let's talk a little bit, let's go back a little bit um, to Islamist jihadists versus the Sufi Muslims, because this is sort of a harbinger of, of, of future radicalization. And on, on the 10th of March, in 2017, there is something called the Aliyar Junction Clash. Um, Zahran Hashim, who we will talk about later, um, as the ringleader of this cell that caused the Easter bombings, he and his followers met up um, in theory to deba debate with Sufis. Sufis are basically a, a more mystical um, uh, followers of Islam, and they are more indigenous to to Sri Lanka and to South Asia. Um, they came from the Arabic traders traveling through the region. They, the Arabic traders came to Sri Lanka and married the Tamil women. So Sri Lankan Muslims are both ethnically distinct and religiously distinct. And this, is, uh, this identity issue has been an issue for them for years. In the mid-2000s, especially in 2006, there was a huge rash of violence against Sufi mosques by other Muslims. And what would become uh, Islam Islamist jihadist Muslims. So a little context to explain this. Um, in the 80s, the um, Wahhabism from Saudi Arabia was starting to have a, a real impact. And um, maids and workers and students who had gone abroad started coming back with more of a Wahhabi, more of a Salafist um, way of thinking about their religion. And they started changing the way they dressed and the way they thought, and, and were much more um, into the one Allah concept, whereas the Sufis had a different concept of Islam. And they were much, again, much more spiritual, not activists in that way. Now let's go back to what I, say, I said was um, really the most serious attack on Muslims um, that instigated um, these attacks on Easter. And 
look at the date on March 2018. That is about a year ago. And most people say it took about a year to prepare for these, these bombings. I mean, it takes a year at least to collect all the materials, to train, et cetera, especially given that they don't have um, hands-on um, people from ISIS there training them. Okay, so in March 2018, after the Digana Kandi riots, Zahar and Hashim, again, uh, we'll talk about him later, released a video. Um, he said, it, we, are, we have to target non-Muslims, moderate Muslims, moderate Muslims even, and Sri Lankan, uh, and police in Sri Lanka. Bombs should be set off all over the country, and he wanted, this, this is kind of important, he wanted to target Muslim, Muslims who preached peace. Now this really upset moderate Muslims a lot. And so they handed over a bunch of these videos to authorities who um, didn't act on them. Also in 2000, November 2018, two police ki were killed. At the time they assumed because of Sri Lankan's sort of infrastructure and military, they're thinking they had had 30 years of war with the Tamil Tigers. They actually wound up arresting two Tamil um, insurgents from the past and did not look at Muslims at all. Um, so basically, we can see this video that he released, and it's, it's incredibly inflammatory, um, as serving as an official warning, um, which is normal in Islamic jurisprudence, um, and he acted on it. Not only with, uh, starting with the killing of the two police, but obviously with the Easter bombings. Um, on various occasions, beginning three years ago, at least three years ago, um, the Muslim Council of Sri Lanka, the Al Ceylon Jamiath Ulama, um, and a range of other sort of other Muslim groups, some of them Sufi, began warning the government about Zahran Hashim. They provided CDs. They, you know, it, there really wasn't any shortage of material. Um, they gave names of people, and uh, he had YouTube videos, social media postings of um, even Al Qaeda stuff. So, in March 2019, Taslim, um, who is a Muslim <coughs> provincial um, official, was shot in an attempted assassination. And this, again, didn't seem like anything, people didn't understand what, what was going on. But he had been looking into an ISIS training camp after um, the attack on the Buddhist um, statues. He'd been looking into those youth and they led them to this massive training camp that we'll talk about in the next section. Okay, so the next section is really about direct threat warnings on this <coughs> Easter attack. Um, in 2013 to 2014, 24 Sri Lankan citizens joined ISIS. The army chief said, we knew what was coming. November 2016, Justice Minister Rajapaksha gave an ISIS speech to parliament. He said, I knew ISIS was preparing for an attack here, but nobody listened. He was then labeled an, an anti-Muslim bigot. You have to understand that Muslims ha do have political political clout there, so um, they're very sensitive about saying much to them in, in, you know, this is a democracy, they matter, their votes matter, and they often vote as a bloc. Um, we can talk about, you can ask me questions about politics later. Um, in January 2019, an ISIS training camp and bomb factory was discovered, it was massive, over 200 pounds of explosive detonators, all kinds of things to make bombs. It was located north of Colombo. This is an area that's really not even a, a Muslim-dominated territory. Um, okay, in 2019, April 4th, 9th, 11th, and the 21st, that is the day of the attack. Even two hours before the attacks, even 10 minutes before the attacks, foreign intelligence agencies were warning Sri Lanka about these bombs. They had names. They had um, addresses of the attackers. They, you know, it included the targets that they were planning. They had so much information. This came out of information that they had mined out of Coimbatore cell that they were looking into. 
So they knew this was coming. Okay, the culprits. Um, the major culprit, you probably, you might recognize this man here. Um, the National Tawhid Jamaat, National One Religion, One God Organization. Its origins um, come from the Tawhid Jamaat in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu, um, which began in the early 2000s. They protested um, social evils and were rumored, again, to have money coming in from the Middle East. Hashim founded um, the NTJ in Sri Lanka in 2012, but at the time it was just a social goods, you know, positive social works. Um, he donated food and stuff like that. Uh, they were not radicalized. Um, Hashim was, was quote unquote, kicked out of the NTGA in 2007. Um, this is possibly a denial and deception tactic or the NTJ could have needed to protect themselves from so much oversight because after 2017, which is when that attack had, uh, told you about um, before, um, he went underground and he, uh, there was a, a warrant out for his arrest. The other group, JMI, the Organization of the Way of Abraham, this, is, this group gets very little coverage in the news and as a re researcher, I find that really, really amazing and um, maybe telling. Uh, this is only one source talks about this group that I have come across, and the, the, uh, he said there are about 150 to 200 members. These are affluent urban urbanites recruited for ISIS, and who were rec recruiting for ISIS since about 2015. So, uh, just in context, a lot of the affluent ur urban um, Muslims are in Colombo, which is on the west of the country, and on the east is more like Zahran Hashim, more. Uh, sort of industrial fishing village um, working class Muslims. So it's a little bit of a socioeconomic difference. Okay, the leadership. For this particular attack, um, almost certainly Mohammed Kasim, Mohammed Zahran Hashim, this man right here. He was born in 86, so he's in his early 30s. He was radicalized as a teen. He had different ideas from his, um, his other Muslim um, um, teachers. He was actually, because his family was so poor, he was sent to a um, Muslim school, which was probably funded by um, the Middle East. His sister said about him, he started to preach against the government, the national flag, against elections, against other religions. He brought catastrophe upon our family. Um, that's probably an understatement, but she may have been lying about her association with him. We could, I can talk about that later as well. So he assembled a like-minded group of people, um, including members of the JMI who were considered to be very hardcore, violent um, extremists. And he conspired to live up to his preaching, and uh, he, he did. Obviously, the biggest culprit of all is ISIS. Um, basically, the leaderless revolution strategy, that is co-opting individuals and groups um, via the internet and via dawah. It's about convincing people and groups to train, plan, execute operations on their own. On the 29th of April, al-Baghdadi came out with a video, his first time in five years. They thought he was dead. Sri Lanka, um, he claimed the Sri Lanka ops for ISIS, and he talked about it as being revenge for losing the caliphate. At this time, Baghuz has just fallen. Al-Baghdadi's video featured Easter bombers' videos pledging to ISIS, which is, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, it's just um, classic ISIS propaganda. In it, he says, our battle today is one of attrition, and God ordered us to wage jihad and did not order us to achieve victory. The only effective method against those governed by man-made law is war. They need to return to the almighty God. As for you brothers in Sri Lanka, they have pleased and healed the Muwahideen's chest with their suicide operations that unsettled the Crusaders in their Easter celebration to avenge their brothers in Bagus. He's making it very, very explicit. This, by God's permission, is only part of the vengeance that is awaiting the Crusaders and their support, supporters. All praise is due to God, for among those killed were some Americans and Europeans. We have seen the savagery brutality and ill intentions of the Christians toward the Muslim community. So we've seen uh, all the data points that were happening. You could see them. If you lived in Sri Lanka, they were happening 
happening right in front of you in the newspapers. They were happening on the television. And behind the scenes, again, there were uh, local communities of Muslims saying, these Islamist jihadists are in our mosques. They are in our neighborhoods. They are coming in our country now. They are taking over parts of our Muslim population, and they are becoming radicalized. We've got to do something, and nobody did anything about it. So now we will get to the technical aspects about the bombs. Now, there are all sorts of uh, crime scene investigators uh, from foreign countries, and the Sri Lankans do a pretty good job themselves. And so this is, uh, these are the data points that we have so far about the bombs. And they were quite powerful. We have some pictures coming up next, so bear with me here. Um, direct your attention, please, to the picture in the upper right-hand corner. This, again, is Hashim with the one-finger salute, uh, the ISIS salute. Next to him is his brother, one of his brothers, Rilwan. And you'll notice he's holding an AK-47, but he's holding them with stubbed fingers. And investigators believe that he was intricately involved in the bomb-making. And the bomb making had gone on for an estimated about a year's time frame. So they were experimenting with different types of explosives. They were experimenting with timing devices, particularly from washing machines. And they were testing these things on motorcycles. It was a year of trial and error. And what you see here with the picture of real one with the AK-47 with the missing fingers and the damaged eye was the error part of trial and error. Um, when the bombings first happened, a lot of commentators came out and said, there's no way that this local yokel type group would have been able to build these very sophisticated, powerful bombs on their own. Um, they said they had to have some kind of ringer come in and teach them how to do this, or the cell members had traveled uh, outside of Sri Lanka and learned how to do it, perhaps in the Middle East, and then come back and uh, to apply their trade here. Um, we don't think that's necessarily true. If you have a year of trial and error, number one, and number two, if ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and they do, post uh, how to make bombs on the internet, um, you can do a lot of this stuff on your own. Um, moreover, the type of explosive used is, was probably TATP. So investigators are saying now uh, they, they have TATP, TATP residue from the scene and possibly other explosives were used, this stuff called water gel. And um, if you direct your eyes to the bottom picture, you'll see a bunch of things that look like blue sticks of dynamite. Um, that is water gel. And water gel is a mining explosive. So you get your water gel, you go out to a rock quarry, you dig a hole, you shove the water gel in there and explode it, and parts of the mountain come off, and then you can carve out a highway or mine it or what have you. And this stuff is made locally in Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, gelignite used to be made there as well. So there's water gel and gelignite throughout Sri Lanka. And every now and then, uh, some fishermen will get their hands on a couple of sticks or a case of it. And they will use it to fish with. So they'll use explosives instead of nets and hook and line. And the Sri Lankan Navy was arresting these guys for doing this uh, well before this bombing attack ever happened. The moral of the story is this. The logistics security, the security chain, from the maker of these explosives to the end user is leaking, obviously, because the fishermen had it, and now we see that this cell had it. And they just didn't have a couple of sticks. We counted these. There were about 100, 182 sticks of this material. And it blows up very rapidly. So uh, the bullet fired from an M4 rifle that the American soldiers carry, that bullet goes just under 3,000 feet per second, right? Faster than a speeding bullet. These explosives, the water gel, can blow up at a rate of uh, 14,000 feet per second or up to 17 or 20,000 feet per second. And that is why explosions bust down walls, turn over cars, and, and kill people. And if you put shrapnel around uh, something that moves that fast, it's gonna do triple the damage. TATP is uh, a type of explosive that both Al-Qaeda and ISIS like to use. It has a velocity of detonation, a VOD, of about 20,000 feet per second as well, if you mix it correctly. But it is incredibly volatile, and they call it, they nicknamed it the mother of Satan, and Rilwan is a testament to that. Um, it's um, not very shock resistant. The water gel, you can take it and throw it on the ground. It's not gonna explode most of the time. Um, the TATP, if you shake it, if you move it, if it, it sustains even a light shock, it can't explode. 
So again, the compound they think was a cocktail of TATP and some of these other explosives, and maybe even ANFO, ammonium nitrate fertilizer mixed with fuel oil. Shrapnel, nails and ball bearings, and we'll show you some shrapnel damage in just a minute in some pictures. The trigger or switch was a pull strap on the backpack, so they're wearing the bombs on uh, they, their backpacks or containing these bombs. They walk in, they grab uh, the, the switch or the trigger in their right hand. Uh, we saw one of the bombers uh, fiddle with one of his uh, triggers uh, in uh, one of the restaurants of the hotel, uh, and this particular device didn't go off. He actually sat down in a booth and tampered with it to try to make it work. So the other bombers walked in, pulled their sticks, basically pulled their straps, and boom. Uh, the detonator, or the initial part, was a, a light bulb filament, and that's what they think at the moment. They have found light bulb filaments at the, uh, some of the bomb factories that this cell was operating, and they also apparently found a light bulb filament near the body of Hashim in the Sri Lanka uh, hotel restaurant. Uh, it was, excuse me, the, uh, the Shangri-La. Um, so these were some pretty, pretty bad bombs. They did a lot of damage, as we will see. St. Sebastian's, two pictures of that on the left. You can see it uh, blew the tiles out of the roof, but you can see the pock marks from the ball bearings, and you, it's hard to see the nail pock marks, but those holes that looks like you could stick your thumbs into, that's from ball bearing damage. St. Anthony's, you can see the blast tore through the plaster and concrete, and the congregation was standing right there. In St. Sebastian's, the congregation was sitting, and at Zion Church down here, and Maylee's gonna talk about this in just a minute, um, he tried to get into that Romanesque archway there, into the church, they wouldn't let him, uh, so there were children out playing, out in this courtyard, and he uh, detonated himself right then and there. The Kingsbury Hotel on the left, you can see the restaurant damage, uh, it's over an 80 foot, probably about a 100 foot uh, uh, blast radius. And you can see the pock marks of the, uh, where the ball bearings, excuse me, hit the windows and they flapped out. The Shangri-La, this is where there were two bombers that came into that particular restaurant. They detonated at either end of the restaurant. And uh, so their blast overlapped each other. And then the Cinnamon Grand, this was all only this is the only picture we were able to get of that, but you can see the damage in there. Lots of people were injured and killed in that particular blast. So the bombs were quite nasty. They were very well built, unfortunately. High casualty rate. So now uh, Mei Li is gonna come in and talk about the church attacks. Okay, the first bomb that detonated, detonated at St. Anthony's Shrine in Colombo. I visited this church. It is it's a beautiful, historic church. Um, in downtown Colombo, or slightly outside of downtown Colombo. It's um, often attended by VIPs. This time it wasn't. If on a normal Easter Sunday, v um, leaders, politicians would have been there and they could have had a, a, they could have killed the politicians and I really think that's what they had hoped for. Unfortunately, there's some infighting going on and nobody showed up. Um, Lots of people showed up, but not, not the politicians. This church is commemorated on a stamp. It's just a, a, a big symbol in Sri Lanka. The bomb detonated at 8.45 a.m. It was the first bomb. Um, it exploded. As you can see, the only video we have of this bomb um, was from a dash cam on a car. And you, what the smoke you see in that, that top picture on the right is basically the sort of the back entrance to the church. The front of the church is on the right, or, or the area where the, the priest would hold mass. Um, the, per, the, the church was packed for Easter Sunday, and so the bomber couldn't get very far, and he wound up detonating mostly in the back, and it actually prevented, I think, too many casualties. Even so, um, there were 54, at least 54 killed there. St. Sebastian's Church in Ngombo. This is the, the highest casualty rate, and this is why. He, um, this is also a beautiful and huge church within a courtyard, and I went to visit, and um, it's massive. Uh, he walks through the courtyard, there's video of him just sailing through, no issues, nobody is stopping him, and he doesn't look like he belongs, he's wearing a backpack, everyone's going to church. He sails through, no big deal, he, t he touches a little girl's head on his way there as if it's no big deal. Um, you can see him in that little bit of a doorway. Uh, that's him, but he actually goes a couple doorways forward, and he actually, you, you see it's not packed the way um, 
St. Anthony's was. He, so he can literally just walk right in the middle of the church. I mean, he, there's a guy with a big backpack. And as a result, his bomb detonated at 847, 105 people. Okay, the, the third church is the Zion Church in Batikaloa. And in fact, this was not the targeted church. And I looked at the targeted church, and this, again, um, the churches that, that were really the targets were high church, Catholic churches, traditional churches, very beautiful, huge number of masses, a lot of times a 1,000 people. Um, they wanted high casualty numbers. They wanted the high profile churches. And this would have been the, probably one of the biggest churches in Batikaloa, which is not in Colombo. The rest of these attacks were happening in Colombo. The Batikaloa is an area on the east coast. East, yes. Um, so it, this guy's wanderings are a little bit convoluted. At 8.30 a.m., he um, walks to inquire about mass at St. Mary's. Mass is normally around 8.45, like everywhere else. Apparently, he missed mass, and everyone is gone. And so he can't detonate at 48.45 like all of the other bombers. So, and plus he was also refused entry. He doesn't look like he's dressed for church, and he looks suspicious. Um, so he returns to the mosque where he was resting before. And I think in... Oh, sorry. So before he returns to the mosque, it, I, I think there is video footage of him walking down the aisle toward, toward the um, Zion Church, which is really around the corner from St. Mary's. He probably finds out what time mass is there. That's my guess. Then he goes back to the mosque, hangs out, changes his clothes, does all these things, comes back again in his bomber uniform. Again, they're all wearing caps and have the backpacks, and they look like they're trying to look like normal people. He tries to convince the people at um, the Zion Church and St. Mary's that he is just wanting to film them. Somebody at the Zion Church did not want to let him in. They seemed to think he was, was suspicious. As a result, he wound up detonating outside of the church, which kept the casualty rate down. Unfortunately, the children were in the courtyard playing, which is why 26 were killed. Almost, almost all of them were children. Um, I, I did a little sleuthing to figure out what time he detonated because the um, CCTV footage is all over the place, and he probably walked eight minutes from this mosque. I don't know. You can. I'm going to step up just a second here. This is a mosque that he hung out at, and this is only about five minutes to St. Mary's. The Zion Church, just a few more minutes away. So he didn't have far to go, and I don't think that's an accident that they chose these areas that had a lot of churches and mosques that they could take a break in before hitting a church. And Jeff will go over the hotel attacks. Right All right, the hotel attacks. <clears throat> the first was the Kingsbury Hotel, and May Lee actually stayed there. Um, this individual in the far upper right, that was that particular bomber. Um, he checked in wearing that bomb backpack. Um, there was video of him, CCTV of him doing that. Um, and uh, in the morning, he simply got up, walked into the Harbor Court breakfast buffet, and detonated at 8.47. It was packed. Um, the Kingsbury Hotel, however, didn't release a lot of information on casualties. We were able to find for sure that there were uh, four Chinese nationals killed and two European nationals, and beyond that, we don't know. Um, but the damage was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the hotel actually was able to remain open, again, because the bomber hit the restaurant, not the lobby or the other part of the hotel. It did not uh, sustain any structural damage in the actual part where guests stay. Um, in the Shangri-La, a very similar pattern. The uh, bombers checked in using their real name, or one of them used his real name. And again, this was probably a lure tactic because he knew that the police uh, shortly afterwards were gonna go to his house where uh, his wife uh, wearing a suicide uh, bomb uh, was waiting. But nevertheless, so there were two bombers again at the Shangri-La. Uh, they were filmed in the lift here, the, the elevator, laughing and joking with each other, smiling, and it, it's not hard to see. Um, they were actually happy about what they were about to do. They entered the Table One's breakfast buffet restaurant area, apparently from different sides, so their blasts would overlap, and they detonated at 8.51 a.m., uh, uh, right. 
and they killed 33 people. Um, as a testament to the Shangri-La, they thought that they were going to be able uh, to open uh, much later on the 19th, but they worked really hard, and they were able to reopen on the 12th. And it's very important to Sri Lanka and these hotels that they get back to business as quickly as possible, not just for business sake, but also for national salvation. Um, and that was the same actually in, uh, in India and Mumbai after the Mumbai uh, hotel attacks and the attacks on the train station and the Jewish center and whatnot. Um, it was a point of national pride to get that city up and operational again. In Sri Lanka, they feel the same way. <clears throat> or the Cinnamon Grand in the upper left-hand corner, the bomber is here on the bottom left. He checked in using a fake name and the next day entered the breakfast buffet just like everybody else did. And the video of him, if you watch it, and they don't show blood and carnage, it's a very technical thing to see. He steps back and forth, side to side, wasn't sure about what he should do, but at 9.12, where that's time stamped, he definitely figured out what he should do and he's detonated. And everybody you see there in the picture uh, was killed. 20 people killed there. The hotel actually remained open and May Lee actually spent some time there as well. Now the new Tropical Inn was a little different. <clears throat> The bomber is in the upper left-hand corner. The owner of this small hotel is in the right-hand corner. The original target of the bomber was the Taj Samudra Hotel, another five-star hotel. This guy checks in at 4.53 uh, p.m. with a piece of roller luggage. He leaves the hotel very shortly thereafter and comes, comes back the next day with another piece of roller luggage. CCTV shows him next walking around the Ports of Call restaurant in the breakfast buffet, just like everybody else with his gray backpack, toggling on this strap that was supposed to detonate his device. It did not explode. He sits in a booth, toggles with it some more, it does not explode, so he leaves. He leaves. He leaves with all three pieces of luggage, the little square roller, his backpack, and a high rectangular piece of luggage. It looks like they were going to do a double tap bombing in the hotel. So that's what we think based on the evidence. So he was going to detonate in the restaurant and either as people fled the hotel through the lobby, which is where we think that he had pre-positioned his other device, again, a roller piece of luggage, or as first responders came in, that was going to detonate as well. But it didn't happen. He was constantly on the phone, very frustrated with his device not going off. And obviously he either received orders or figured out on his own because it was prearranged, we're not sure which. He left the Taj Hotel, checked into the new Tropical Inn, again, a budget hotel. That happened at 9.30. He left shortly thereafter, comes back at 1.30, and boom, he detonates. There were two people in the hotel, and they both got killed. And it nearly leveled the building. All right, three more bombs. Again, the day of the attack, there was a police raid on one of the bombers' condominiums where his wife was waiting with an IED. Police came to the door, she met them, she runs up the stairs to where her children were, the police follow her, again she detonates, killing her unborn child, three children, and three police officers. Later on, Hashim's brother, Will Rilwan, said, our wives are going to detonate and they're gonna meet us in heaven. So again, there's no question that these were come on or lure style attacks, they were ambushes, and it was all thought out like a chess match. Same day, 21 April, this pipe bomb that did not detonate near the airport. Uh, reporting right now, the best data points we have say it was at the airport access road. May Lee came and went from the airport. There's a lot of roads around the airport, a lot of ways to access this airport, but the one main access road was about 100 yards away from the airport. Um, this is where we think the IED was placed, but we're not sure. If it is the case, however, 110 pounds of explosives, so said the government, would have created a blast radius of about 400 meters. So if the bomb was about 100 or more meters away, that shock wave would have hit the airport. It would have uh, hurt or, or killed people between the blast wave and the airport, and it could have damaged the airport as well. The airport would have been shut down. So think about this. Three churches, four hotels, these lure, these come on bombings, and an airport bombing, if it had all happened, it would have been more spectacular than it already was. And it was already hellacious enough as it was. Um, but again, the Air Force ended up blowing that, the, an Air Force ground team ended up blowing that up uh, in place, or not in place, I think they removed it and blew it up later. And that's a piece of the pipe from that bomb. 
Uh, 22 April, police found this white van outside St. Anthony's Shrine. It had an IED in it. They were either inspecting it or preparing it to blow it in place, and it detonated. Um, again, that was the bomb that was designed to catch first responders that were going to St. Anthony's Shrine. If it had been, if it had blown up according to plan, again, the casualty rate would have been much, much higher. Aftermath, all right, Maylee is gonna tackle this. Despite a lot of the political issues that led up to the intelligence failure that led to the, the bombing, um, the aftermath was a little bit better, a lot better, actually. Um, there was a nationwide emergency, a curfew was imposed, lots of increased security. When I went there, security almost outnumbered people on the streets. The arrest powers were widened. Social media was restricted. I was still able to use WhatsApp, but Facebook, Twitter, these things were down. Um, as a background, Facebook was used um, to cause some, a lot of the problems that I discussed before, and there's, there's a whole backstory to that, but it also had, was being used to create riots, and um, it was, you know, we see this everywhere in, in um, Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, people would take to Facebook and post uh, fake news and then they would meet and there would be violence. So a lot of people really feel like this was not a bad move actually, even though um, you know the liberal society that wanted to remain <laughs> liberal complained about it because it, it, um, it prevented some people from communicating with their loved ones naturally. So it, we know Facebook is a double-edged sword. Anyway, there was a ban on face veils. So, like I said before, Muslim women had started to wear face veils a lot more than they used to because traditionally, in the past, when the Sufis were more of a majority, and now they're a minority, um, they w they look like regular um, Sri Lankan women uh, who are majority um, Buddhist, and they they might have something covered their head, but not a, a veil over their face. There were weeks and weeks of raids and search ops, and they were televised. You can actually watch these. That's on purpose to send a message. This is what um, my government um, contact told me. They would search women as well, um, Muslim women, and my um, Muslim <laughs> community leader asked me to ask the um, military, my military friend, why they would do this because it was offensive for men to search women. And he said it was to send a message that there would be no tolerance. And to be fair, women were included in among these suicide bombers. It was a valid thing to do. Um, so over 500 were arrested. Um, 102 in police custody were brought in um, for links to the attack. Scores of weapons, lots and lots of weapons were found. Um, I would want to add that there were white dresses found. This is a dress that um, Buddhist women will wear to Buddhist um, on major Buddhist holidays, especially one that was coming up. And um, we're not going to go into it here, but a second wave of attack might have been, and very logistically would have been, at a, a major Buddhist holiday on May 19th called Visak. There were also military uniforms found, and they actually wound up arresting a man who was making these military uniforms. There, were government, there was a government scandal. Uh, there's a lot of infighting going on that is probably part of the intelligence failure problem. There were scores of resignations. Um, this, all of this attack is um, exacerbated a already bad situation between the president and the prime minister of Sri Lanka. The police chief um, refused to resign, but he was let off. Um, the defense minister and intelligence chiefs did resign. Nine, over nine Muslim mi ministers um, were asked to resign, forced to resign, volunteered to resign. We were not sure. Um, the FBI, India's NIA, their intelligence agency, um, Australia, Interpol, all, all cooperated in getting suspects. Saudi Arabia deported five Sri Lankan citizens linked to the attacks. One of them, Mohammed Milhan, um, is considered maybe part of the leadership of the next wave of attacks. Um, he was also connected to a 2018 killing of the two police that I mentioned uh, several slides back. There were um, numerous de deportations from Sri, Sri Lanka. 
600 with links to Islamism, um, including 200 clerics who used to have a free ride coming into Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka was kind of considered a migration hub for other Islam Muslims visiting, and they had free reign to um, preach however they wanted. Um, exp people who had expired visas from India, Pakistan, Ma Bangladesh, the Maldives were all forced to leave. Again, Buddhist and Muslim violence not surprisingly became a problem again in places, especially in the northwest of the country. Hundreds of Muslims were homeless. There was an attack, um, I think Jeff mentioned it, as recently as Monday. So this is really an ongoing problem. And um, to be fair, the government is, is messaging as much as they can um, about trying to keep the peace. And Muslim leaders have, and, and um, Catholic priests have said repeatedly to their flock um, to calm down, not to um, be involved in riots. Another huge aftermath would include Hashim's family's final stand. On the 26th of April at 7.30 in Santa Maratu, local police went with local Muslims in the neighborhood um, to look at, at this house where people were coming and going and they seemed very suspicious and they hadn't always lived there. The special task force came in and also uh, police, regular police, actually three forces came in and there was a, a firefight between some young men in the house and the special task force. After about an hour, three suicide bombs went off. When they went in, what they found was nine of Hashim's family members, including six children nieces and nephews, and one, of, uh, one child was his son. This included Hashim's father and two of Hashim's brother, including the one with the missing digits from attempting to make bombs. They had been in a video earlier, um, the three of them, his two brothers and his father, who had all been in, involved in the NTJ along with Hashim, um, in a video basically saying that they, this was not the end. Um, Zaini, his younger brother, uh, said, the killings won't stop here, even if we are destroyed. You can be sure you will meet more of these attacks in the future. Also, there were uh, explosives found, an ISIS flag, um, not too far from this, from where they detonated, they had just found another huge kind of safe house and lots of bomb making materials, um, stuff, uh, including a drone, a drone that was really popular among um, ISIS, ISIS um, fighters back in 2016. I think that might show up in the next video. They also found a terrorist training camp, another one. Remember before they found one um, north of Colombo? This one was near, closer to Katankudi, which is a Muslim majority town, and this is where Hashim came from. On May 4th, they found this, it, I think it's about um, 10 acre plot of land owned by Mohammed Milhan, and it was covering as a chicken farm, but they, believe that um, over 100 militants trained here from far away, from foreigners, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lankan. So not just local trainees. Um, they found pipe bomb materials and evidence of firearms training. Jeff, we'll start with the conclusions. So I'm gonna cover some of the tactical analyses, the, uh, the analyses, what we learned, what it means up to this point, and then Mei Li is gonna wrap it up with the assessments. What might all of this mean for the future? And again, uh, this was a very technical operation, very well done. It looks like it was ISIS's first major post-caliphate operation. So it was the first big operation they conducted after losing the physical caliphate. Again, from the beginning uh, in, the, in the opening, we know it was a very sophisticated, a series of multi-stage bombings. This wasn't one suicide bomber walking into some place and yanking his own cord. This wasn't some lone shooter going into a place, shooting the place up. This was a highly synchronized, very well-organized multi-stage event. Um, we would rate it as highly successful, both tactically and strategically. Why is that? The kill rate, uh, the casualty rate, 758 total. It achieved the requisite uh, level of shock and horror, and tourism was negatively impacted. We can see tourism in Sri Lanka was just starting to build up. The Lonely Planet guidebook said that Sri Lanka was the number one tourist destination for the Lonely Planet uh, series uh, of books for 2019, and that's over. Um, they were earning about 4.4 billion, roughly 5% of their GDP on tourism, and it was just getting bigger and bigger. The giant, <clears throat> the giant hotel chains that are based actually not far from here were pouring money 
into uh, Sri Lanka. They were building great big properties there. <clears throat> they will definitely be going forward with that, but they've lost a year of tourist revenue. And of course, the government was negatively impacted as well. There are criminal indictments being filed against various ministers, various government personnel that did not forward the uh, appropriate intelligence to the people that needed it on time. The tactical operational analysis in military terms, this particular cell had its personnel, intelligence, operational expertise, and logistics, the G1 through 4, G1, 2, 3, and 4. They had it all lined up uh, very well. They did an amazing job. We did not include uh, finance and communications on this, uh, but that's, that's for another uh, presentation. But suffice to say, they operated like a well-oiled military machine, and the results prove it. Again, at least 12 operatives, 11 targets, nine good hits. And again, they studied and understood the flow of Sri Lankan law enforcement and military operations, and they were able to get inside those security operation decision cycles and attack them. And that is what the American military refers to as operational art. These guys were really good at what they did. Intelligence failures. The intelligence failures are well talked about in the press and the Sri Lankan government is beating itself up more than anybody else. But we categorize those intelligence failures under two particular uh, issues. A failure to heed the intelligence. They had the information right in front of them. It talked about how bad the threat was. It said exactly what the threat was going to be or at least some of the targets and they didn't do anything about it. That literally means somebody in the Sri Lankan government saw that material and said, eh, that's not a big deal. <laughs> Failure to disseminate. Somebody in the Sri Lankan government was looking at that intelligence and decided, my colleagues don't need this. The police special operations outfit, uh, they don't need this. Uh, the Air Force ground uh, uh, element, they don't need this. And we know Sri Lankan military personnel and they were very good at what they do. If the people that I know, if they had that intelligence, they would have acted on it immediately, but that didn't happen. Also, PC hysteria, being called a Muslim bigot, standing up in front of parliament saying, Sri Lankan people are joining ISIS, and now they're coming home. This is a problem. We've got to do something about it. That helped blind the government, and obviously the government infighting between the president's office and the prime minister's office helped as well. We would categorize hotel security as negligent in this particular case. Why? Because if you are working uh, security in Sri Lanka, especially at hotels, and you're reading the morning newspapers and you're watching these things unfold on television, the uh, Muslim versus Buddhist riots, the ISIS camp that was discovered in January with over 100 sticks of explosives and about 100 detonators, et cetera, that spells trouble. And this is a paradigm that, that we've seen unfold in Myanmar, Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, different places in Africa, all over the Middle East. This is how the Islamist jihadists operate. So if you're in Sri Lanka, you're operating a hotel, you see this coming your way. This is what we call totality of circumstances, and they didn't do anything about it. It could be that somebody in security at one of the hotels said, hey boss, we would really like to implement some kind of bomb inspection team as people are coming in. And it could have been that someone said no. Um, but we might not ever know that, but we believe this was a case of negligence. And then one more issue about target selection. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, other Islamist jihadists, they pick hotels and churches, especially hotels, but certainly in the past couple of years, uh, Christian institutions um, as, a, uh, as a priority. It's part of their standard operating procedure. This is what they do. Um, so hitting churches, and hotels in Sri Lanka, or, or the fact that they pick these targets, it's not that much of a surprise, but it, is, it does reflect how vicious they are. Um, the other interesting analytical point that comes out of this is that these were targets within targets. So they just didn't hit a hotel, as in drive up a car bomb in front of the lobby and have that detonate. Now, that would have been spectacular in and of itself but they decided to instead attack the Sunday buffet lines and Easter congregations, right? So they were looking for the biggest mass of people that they could target, and they were methodical. They sat down and they said, how can we build an explosive device that will spew shrapnel into these masses of people, and where should we do that? And that is where these data points come from, and that was the final analysis here. So it's, it's pretty... Uh, Pretty cold, pretty calculated on their part. And we are about to wrap up.
with uh, final analyses, and I'm going to let May Lee cover that, the conclusions. Okay, so ISIS will act on its words as per usual. So what were its words? It, what they said, basically, war for the sake of war. In other words, the end goal of victory is not necessary. Um, attrition, high casualty counts. Again, I think they aim for higher, and, but they, they got high. Revenge, in this case, um, new, the new angry motivation for losing the caliphate. Tagut, this is governments ruled by man's law, particularly democracies, um, which are haram, forbidden, un-Islamic. Americans and EU citizens, they've said it before. These are their targets. And then more to come. They talk about having more targets. Um, this is the official Islamist jihadist warning that has been issued already by al-Baghdadi, also by the Islamist jihadists in Sri Lanka. Okay, ISIS basically sowed the seeds of religious war in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a very culturally and ethnically diverse country. It's not hard in these regions with this kind of diversity to do this. The Sri Lankan bombing operational model is to be replicated when and where possible. It was clearly successful. Why would they not replicate this? The leaderless revolution will continue. Strikes against non-traditional targets and across the dispersed ISIS provinces. Non-traditional targets meaning Sri Lanka, which was not tr traditionally in the sights of Islamists. But then within the provinces, and we know on May 10th, in May, several provinces were announced, Turkey, India, and I think one other. Tourism and hotels are increasingly at risk, obviously, for, because they have foreigners, especially Westerners, and tourism, it, it impacts the country, and you know, the countries are made up of governments. The governments are not Islamic. Churches, Christianity, other religions, Muslim minorities like the Sufis, who are not practicing the quote-unquote right type of Islam, are increasingly at risk, just as we saw in Sri Lanka. So governments cannot com combat ISIS alone. This is really a, a whole society effort. Um, they need to cooperate between governments internationally. Corporations need to be involved. People need to be involved. Um, citizens need to be involved. Something I've noticed um, happening you know, over the past few years is that in, I'd love to see the lessons learned there applied here. And I wonder how wise our own police forces, government agencies are coordinating. You, what, what you see happen is you know, say something happens in Prince George's County, an incident, and they just swarm. It seems like everybody and his brother goes there, and I mean, there's so many police vehicles there, it takes them a long time to get out, because they're all blocked in. Right. And it would just seem like, you know, any kind of terrorist watching this would learn from this that, you know, do a diversionary thing in one area and get all the assets there. And I mean, I wonder how well coordinated our police and, and stuff in, in this area are in measuring like what's the need and send proportionate personnel but retain right. the rest of the personnel in place. Yeah, in reserve. Yeah. Right, yeah. because of a double tap style situation. Or triple or triple. Right, exactly, and like what happened here. So uh, Department of Homeland Security and the FBI and other uh, law enforcement uh, entities in the United States, they have intelligence assets under their own roofs, and they study these kinds of things. Um, but I'm not 100% sure how much of this will translate to a standard operating procedure of exactly what you're talking about, sending just the right amount of people and watching for that follow-on style attack. Um, that is definitely something to look for. And ISIS wants to replicate this, just like May Lee said. Um, this is the standard bearer for bombing operations going forward. Now, can they do it? Uh, we'll see, because this took a lot of planning. It was very sophisticated. And we say the enemy gets a vote, right? But the governments get a vote also uh, when ISIS is trying to carry out an operation. Yes, sir, in the corner. Right, you missed so I was very, thank you very much for your presentation. I thought it was very, very interesting. My question has to do with the role of the clergy. I'm Catholic. The clergy, when you mentioned the priest and everything, they calm people down. It seems to me that if you never fight back, you're always going to lose. Do you have, a, at least you have an opinion on that? <laughs> do I have an opinion? <laughs> I, think, I think that's, that's a valid statement. Um, 
in, in the context of Sri Lanka, they are a minority, um, and they are actually multi-ethnic. Uh, the, the Catholics and Christians come from the different ethnicities in, in um, Sri Lanka, unlike the Buddhists, who are typically Sinhalese, and the Muslims, who have their own kind of Tamil origins. Um, so I, I don't, this is a, um, Every, every situation is a little different. This was, the Christians, this is a little bit of a blind spot that happened in Sri Lanka. The Christians were not a traditional target of anybody. And this is why I think some of the intelligence failure was based on the idea that there really wasn't an issue between Muslims and Christians historically. There were grievances between the, the Tamil tigers and the, the, the Buddhists. I mean, it was everyone really except Christian, that particular Venn diagram of Christian, Muslim uh, strife was not there. It, you saw me describe some of them and that was not one of them. And so they didn't, they don't have this mindset that they have to fight back. Um, and I think that has more to do with it than should they fight back. I, I don't think they're seeing themselves in this um, right now um, as part of this global group of Christians who are being um, persecuted. They, I think that's changing. I, I'm not saying that, I think that's definitely changed after this attack. And uh, you hear um, the cardinal say some of this, um, and he really, they really take the po politicians to task for their intelligence failure. They lost so many people. Ma'am? Yeah. Thanks. Um, the, uh, the similarities between this attack and uh, the Mumbai attacks back in 2000, what was it, nine? Eight. 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 November. Um, are striking, of course. Yeah. Um, the National Talki Jamaat, of course, is Deobandi, as are many of the terror Islamic groups of, of South Asia. Um, and we know, of course, that the Mumbai attacks were orchestrated by the Pakistani ISI intelligence service. Um, what are the connections you see with the Sri Lankan attacks and Pakistani intelligence? Uh, none yet. It's too early. And I'm sure there will be some kind of accusations coming out, but I, I have no idea. But it, Did, didn't some of the attackers train in Kashmir? Um, there have been rumors that they trained in all sorts of places. But in we, Kashmir? It, well, all sorts of places, but we, I haven't seen hard data points on that. And that's what we're, we're looking for that, we're waiting for that. But we presented the hardest data points that we could find. And if it was leaning a little bit toward the rumor mill, we backed off of it a little bit. But it, it does make sense. You bring up a great point. Yeah, there, there's um, a lot. Even even one of them, you know, going to Syria, there's one very reliable source that says that he did go, one very reliable source that he didn't go. Right. So there's a lot of information that's not known. And so Kashmir could be. Most of the contacts um, with Sri Lanka have to do with India, southern India and Kerala. Sir, you mentioned people not paying attention to the warning signs. Right. Might that not have been delivered by people on the inside? Mm -hmm. And might not the uh, failure to raise the issue, <clears throat> like we've seen here, you're called nasty names if you point out the threat. Right. Um, there were those accusations made in, in Sri Lanka that uh, some of the politicians wanted something like this to happen in order to benefit uh, politically from the carnage. And there was one individual who was quoted in the press, and I can't remember who he was, but he said something akin to, we didn't think it was going to be that bad. And when you have somebody say something like that, it leans a little bit more toward what you're bringing up. But we've only heard one instance of that, but it, it certainly is possible. Do you have anything to add? No, they, there's, yeah, that's, that's exactly yeah. it. And, and there, there, there are politics that we didn't get into here. Um, and I think sometimes it's the politics that say more about the situation than we, right. we can, you know. Delve into. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a short question. Yes, sir. <laughs> the first point here is hold the, mic up. the first point here is that the LTTE has left huge caches of ammunition and weapons in Sri Lanka, and these will be used. I'm not sure where and when. Uh, the second point is that there was a tacit tru truce uh, between the, um, the Tamil Tigers and the Muslim groups yeah. right. when the, the Tamil Guard. Tigers 
became truly an effective military force. Right. And whether this continues to be an extension of that, I'm not sure. Right. And I leave it at that. Having said that, I add, I wrote a book on the LTT. Oh, excellent. Well, we should have a talk afterwards. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Quick, quick, quick. Last question. Oh, well. Last question. Um, Long-term logic, so something like this, and it had, your first point in the conclusions was uh, war for the sake of war, and I understand that point because I, actually it doesn't matter if we win immediately right. uh, and go without victory, but there is, there is long-term logic. I um, surveyed the first 10 issues of Davik magazine, wrote a paper on it, right. surveying the sources that they were citing, and it was all, how do you think, wrong sources? I mean, the 70, 80% of the, of the actual copy was that. Right. They're following the example. The actual jurisprudence specifics of these kind of attacks aside, set aside, they're following the example of striking terror. And I, I was just noticing, I think in the past couple of days, here we are, nine, we are 18 years post 9 11. Right. And there is an initial swing towards getting serious about this kind of stuff too, but look, look where we are as a nation now in, right. in terms of you know, being afraid to, uh, you know, uh, he's politically correct and right. treating things with kid gloves. So, we haven't even labeled the enemy. Right. In stark terms. It's yes. very vague and very general still. Yeah, so there's a psychological effect of, of these things. So I just don't know if you have any thoughts of, you know, about the sort of the long range the strategy and uh, logic of what they've done. U.S. law or, or ISIS strategy. In general, but I mean, obviously this is something. Well, they, they, yeah. they feed off of all that chaos. And, you know, so the, the management of savagery uh, was the ISIS playbook, originally written by Al-Qaeda, but adopted by ISIS. Mm -hmm. And this is what they want. This is precisely what they need. And they need this internal strife in Sri Lanka to boil over and get worse. Um, so they can come in and literally, according to ISIS phraseology, manage that savagery and step in and say, we will be the hair bringers of law and order now. All you have to do is join our ideology and we'll make everything better. And that's really what they want to do in just about every theater they operate in. But they also create that uh, savagery as well. They create that chaos.